So welcome everyone. Hi, thanks for joining us. This uncharacteristically spring-like spring day in Ann Arbor, where this special guest lecture co-sponsored by the Confucius Institute and the Department of Comparative Literature. I'm David Porter from the Departments of English and Comparative Literature, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this afternoon. Wang Ning is Distinguished Professor of English and Comparative Literature and Director of the Center for Comparative Literature and Cultural Studies at Tsinghua University, as well as Zhu Yuan, Chair Professor of Humanities at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. He has authored or co-authored nearly 20 books on topics of, in the study of modern Chinese and Western literature from the perspectives of translation studies, globalization, psychoanalysis, postmodernism, and cultural studies. He has edited the nine-volume series, Frontiers of Literary History, for Peking University Press, as well as dozens of additional collections and special journal issues in Chinese and English. His theoretical interest in translation is grounded in substantial practical experience, he is having translated a number of works of literature and cultural criticism from English into Chinese. Attempting even to summarize the range of the articles he's published would take us well into the dinner hour. So I'll limit myself here simply to sharing the titles of his two most recently published books in English, which are Globalization and Cultural Translation, uh, published in 2004, and Translated Modernities, Literary and Cultural Perspectives on Globalization in China, published in 2010. Professor Wang is well known on the international lecture circuit and literary studies, having held visiting fellowships at the National Humanities Center at Research Triangle Park, the University of Göttingen, Cambridge University, and Washington University in St. Louis, uh, the University of Toronto, and the University of Illinois, among many others. We're delighted he's able to join us in Ann Arbor here today to share his thoughts on translation and the relocation of cultures. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wong. Thank you very much, um, Professor David Porter. Uh, and it's uh, a great pleasure and honor for me here. And today, you know, I'm going to uh, address a topic uh, concerning uh, both literary study and translation studies. So the title is a translation and a relocation of global. I have uh, changed a little bit. Uh, relocation of global cultures, mainly a Chinese perspective, in which I tried to uh, to you know. Uh, discuss and develop Homi Baba's idea, uh, the location of culture, in which Homi Baba tries to, to argue that translation is actually a kind of uh, cultural location. But still, you know, Homi Baba uh, uses uh, culture in a singular form. I try to use uh, culture in a plural form, because uh, to, uh, to me, translation uh, not only plays a role of location, one culture in the English-speaking world, but also translation also has changed and remapped uh, world, global culture and uh, um, world uh, literature. Uh, which uh, made originally uh, marginal literature and culture move from periphery to center and in an attempt yes, to deconstruct the monolithic center. So as far as uh, the function of translation is concerned, it has been defined uh, differently by different scholars. Uh, but uh, mostly on the level of interlingual translation. When we talk about uh, translation, yes, we uh, used to quote, uh, you know, Roman Jakobson's uh, in the division of translation uh, from interlingual translation to in interlingual translation uh, to intersemiotic inter translation. According to Homi Baba, translation is also regarded as a sort of location of culture. That is, a translation would relocate different cultures in different places uh, in the age of globalization. Obviously, such an idea has widely impacted contemporary translation studies as well as uh, cultural studies, making it change its status, especially from a cultural perspective. But to what extent Chinese culture is relocated in the remapping of global culture and world literature has attracted the atten critical and the scholarly attention of um, all those who are interested in China and Chinese studies. To me, in the age of globalization, uh, 
Cultural diversity is more apparent uh, than cultural homogeneity. As a direct consequence of such uh, cultural location and relocation, in this aspect, translation has changed uh, its traditional status and been always playing an inevitable role. But it has long transcended over the mere linguistic rendition. If we say that large-scale literary and cultural translation in the first half of the 20th century enabled Chinese literature and culture closer to the mainstream of world culture and literature, then the practice of China's literary and cultural translation in the past decade has made it possible for Chinese literature and culture uh, to dialogue with international community in an um, equal manner. But the difference between the two lies in uh, that the former was achieved at the expense of westerning, uh, westernizing Chinese culture and language. But the latter will enable Chinese literature and culture to contribute more to global culture and world literature. And, um, and the culture to contribute, yes, more to global culture and literature. As a such, uh, cultural translation is relocating global cultures and remapping uh, world uh, literature and uh, literatures. Here I use uh, global culture uh, both in singular form as well as in plural form, and also world uh, literature both in singular form and uh, plural form. Because uh, to me, uh, if we use it in singular form, we just uh, regard the culture and literature in general. But if we use it in plural form, we just uh, try to uh, distinguish uh, different uh, literary and cultural environments in a broad uh, context of uh, global culture and world uh, literature. The first part is uh, uh, from global Englishes to global Chinese. Here I, I also use um, global Englishes and glo uh, to global Chinese. Although uh, some um, English scholars have used the term yeah, global Englishes. Uh, I think uh, it's the first time yes, uh, for me to use global Chinese because to, to me, Chinese has also been changing uh, its status from uh, one Chinese into different Chinese. Yeah. Undoubtedly, uh, in international communication and academic exchange, scholars from different countries have to give up their own mother tongue, speaking English. Uh, the lingua franca in the present era. But how shall we preserve our national and cultural identity while still using another language? This is a question confronting all of us whose mother tongue is not the hegemonic language, but who could not but use it as disseminating our ideas. In one of my previous articles dealing with globalization and culture, I tried to pluralize both English and Chinese in an attempt to highlight the diversity that globalization has brought to contemporary culture. In this section of my paper, yes, I will first uh, have to uh, revisit to this issue, but lay more emphasis on global cultures. To many Western intellectuals, China is the biggest winner of globalization, especially yes, to Francis Fukuyama, who had an interview with a Chinese scholar Yu Keping uh, at the invitation of Xinhua News Agency. He said, China is the biggest uh, winner of globalization, not only economically, but also politically. I should add uh, one factor, also culturally. Yeah, not only uh, economically, but also politically and culturally. It is true more or less, especially in speaking of language and literature. Although there has been a Chinese fever in the past few years, with hundreds of Confucian institutes set up worldwide, we have to admit that the position of English as a world lingua franca cannot be changed. As one <coughs> has clearly noticed, however, I quote, the growth of the use of English as the world's primary language for international communication has obviously been continuing for several decades. But even as the number of English speakers expands further 
Uh, there are signs that the global prominence of the language may fade within the foreseeable future. According to you know, David Godot, uh, in uh, about uh, 10 years, uh, Chinese will replace the hegemonic position of English, but I don't think so. Um, uh, maybe Chinese will become uh, more and more popular, but it will never replace the position of English. It is true that in the age of globalization, the hegemonic dominance of English as a major world language has been severely challenged by several other forceful languages, among which Chinese stands most outstanding and most forceful, as Chinese is spoken by the majority of the people as the mother tongue. But I, unfortunately, uh, most of the Chinese speakers uh, live in mainland China. You know, only uh, l less than 100 million people who speak Chi uh, Chinese uh, live uh, outside of China. As we know, the position of Chinese has been rising rapidly, largely due to the rise of the Chinese economy and the comprehensive capacity of China as a political and a cultural power. But still, according to statistics, some 30% of the world's books are published in English. Chinese is second at 11%. Still, there is a, a huge uh, difference uh, between the English publication and the Chinese publication. If we take into consideration of the wide use of internet, we will find that more information is disseminated in English. But along with the rise of Chinese fever, this percentage has already changed and will continue to change in the near future. The Chinese fever in the recent international book fairs has certainly proved this. Just as Homi Baba illustrates, it's, uh, in the current world, on the one hand there is the process of globalization, but on the other hand there is the process of minoritization, uh, which is almost another type of globalization. Yeah, Hong Baba is very good at uh, creating some new terms and uh, new, uh, new ideas as well as some new words. So minoritization is created by him. Uh, according to, uh, to Baba, I quote, we are led to a philosophical and a political responsibility for conceiving of minoritization and globalization in a dynamic, even dialectical relation that goes uh, beyond the polarizations of the local and the global, the center and the periphery, or indeed the citizen and the stranger. The most recent United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, report of the World Commission of Culture and Development suggests that the minoritarian condition is indeed a kind of global citizenship. End of the quote. In this situation, the world language system has largely been remapped with some of the originally imperial hegemonic languages such as French, German, Russian and Japanese uh, weakening and other newly emergent languages becoming more and more popular such as Spanish, uh, Arabic and Chinese. And the new framework of world culture has thus been reconstructed. It is therefore very appropriate to use the term globalization to describe this sort of tension in the future orientation of world culture and literature. Then one may well raise another question. In the age of globalization, now what is the future orientation of Chinese since Chinese economy has been developing by different bounds in the past decades. This is what I will discuss in the last section of my, my speech. In this section, I just want to describe what has happened to Chinese whose position has in the past decade changed from a national language to a regional as well as a major uh, world language. Apparently, China as a large country of the biggest population and the vast territory in the world was once called the Middle Kingdom, the so-called Zhongyang Di Guo. But it was not long after the Opium War 
broke out in 1840, when a series of shameful treaties were signed between its weak governments and those of the Western empires and Russia and Japan, according to which large territories were either occupied or colonized by these imperial empires. This could not but have influenced the popularity of the Chinese language and culture. In the northeastern part of the country and the island of Taiwan, people were forced to learn Russian or Japanese and even communicate in the foreign languages in their own homeland. And in Hong Kong, all the government employees should have a good grasp of English rather than in Chinese and all the official documents were issued first in English, as it had been a colony of Britain until 1997. The once golden empire was thus dissolved and gradually marginalized in the world. In order to resume its past splendor and the comprehensive power, China had to identify itself with those economically developed and politically powerful countries. In this aspect, translation played an important role. Due to its overall westernizing practice, Chinese culture almost became a marginalized colonial culture, although China has never been totally colonized in the past. The Chinese language has once been Europeanized or colonized as a result of large-scale translation of Western literary works and the culture and theoretical trends. Almost all the Chinese intellectuals thought that to identify China with those world powers, it was all the more necessary to catch up with them politically and culturally, as well as economically, which finds a particular embodiment in the speeches and the works uh, uh, written by uh, Lu Xun and uh, Liang, Qi, uh, Liang Qicao and uh, some others. Uh, what they could do was to translate as many Western scientific notions, cultural trends, and the philosophical theories into Chinese as possible. Thus, two honorable gentlemen had been brought, to, brought in China, Mr. De, democracy, and Mr. Sai, science, whose position was regarded even higher than Mr. Kong, uh, Confucius. Chinese political and cultural modernity was born largely as a direct consequence of translation, and Confucius and his Confucian doctrine were severely criticized and even, um, even attacked in the past uh, decades. Even such a leading Chinese intellectual and writer as Lu Xun spent more time translating foreign works than producing his own literary works. Uh, Lu Xun translated uh, uh, several uh, novels from foreign languages into Chinese, but he uh, never produced any uh, novel of his own. On the other hand, Chinese culture has also been traveling abroad, with lots of Chinese immigrants settling down in different countries. Although such large-scale immigration has brought some of the Chinese culture conventions abroad, the Chinese language did not make much influence at first. Having emigrated in the foreign countries, many of the overseas Chinese, first of all, think of how to be involved in the mainstream culture of their uh, residential countries. But if they really want to be involved in the mainstream culture, they have to be good at its language. And if they want to master the spirit of the foreign language, they have to express their ideas in the language at the expense of putting their own native language out of mind. Such phenomena are ironically described in quite a few Chinese-American writings. These writers actually play the role of translators, not the sort of word-for-word -word, uh, translators, but that relocating Chinese culture in another culture environment. But more people only think of how to make Chinese culture adapted to their residential countries, cultures, so as to cater favor to the Western audience. 
Many other Chinese immigrants, however, constantly promote Chinese language and culture in their residential countries. Take the case of North America, for example. In today's North American universities, many uh, children of the second or third generation of Chinese immigrants study Chinese language and culture in the East Asian department in an attempt to seek their original national and cultural identity. These are the experiences that many of the Chinese American writers and intellectuals have undergone. Some of them are often in a contradictory state. On the one hand, they try to express their ideas out of their Chinese experience in the English language. But on the other hand, in order to cater favor to their mainstream cultural taste, they have to describe Chinese culture in conventions in a critical and even distorted way. But in any event, their translation of Chinese culture has, after all, promoted Chinese culture in the world, although sometimes in a distorted or misleading way. It is indeed a fact that Chinese has grown to become another major world language, which is of certain relevance to the popularization of Chinese culture and literature worldwide. If it has really achieved the effect of being inclusive and hybridized like English, Chinese would be made the second major world language next to English, for it could play the unique role that English cannot play. And in more aspects, it could function as a major uh, world language in the interactive and complementary way with English. The process of cultural globalization has broken through the fixed nation state boundary and expanded the boundaries of some of the major uh, world languages. On the one hand, uh, the popularization of Chinese as a regional global language is pushing forward the process of globalization. And on the other hand, the globalization in culture has also promoted uh, the popularization of Chinese worldwide. In this process of the changing roles of language, some of the major languages have become victims of cultural globalization, while the originally popular and frequently used languages such as English, Chinese, and Spanish have become more and more popular, which has not only helped uh, remap the established world language system, but also set up a new framework of global language and cultures, uh, within which Chinese will play a more and more important role. In a new framework of different cultures coexisting and complementing each other, Chinese culture will also play an increasingly important role, along with the rise of Chinese fever in the world. As translators and scholars of translation studies, what shall we do? to relocate Chinese culture in the broad context of globalization since the function of translation has been changing. And this is what I will discuss in the next section. So then I will deal with the topic translating China and relocating global cultures. Yeah. It is known <coughs> that in modern Chinese culture and intellectual history, translation has indeed played an important role in bringing in China the most recent cultural trends and theories and excellent literary works, thus making Chinese culture and literature closer to the mainstream of world culture and literature. To many people, modern Chinese literary history is almost a translated literary history. But when we reflect on the great achievements made in literary and cultural translation, we could not but feel a bit regret. In enthusiastically translating foreign, especially Western academic thoughts and literary works into Chinese, we have seldom translated our own cultural theories and literary works into the major uh, world languages. Even if some of the Chinese translators, such as Yang Xianyi and his British wife, Gladys Yang, have made much effort in translating Chinese literature into English. The circulation and reception of these works in the English-speaking world are far from satisfactory. 
with many of their translated Chinese literary works, only consulted now and then by a few specialists in Sinology or translation studies. Thus, many people do think that to translate Chinese culture and literature into foreign languages is a task of the translators, of the target languages. Only those native speakers could do the job well, as it is easy to find quite a few successful examples. It is more or less true, as Gao Xingjian is fortunate enough to have met outstanding translator Mabel Li, who has put his representative work, So Mountain Ningsan, into excellent English, which has undoubtedly helped him to win the Nobel Prize for Literature in the year 2000. The same is even truer of Moye, the Nobel laureate in 2012, who has met Howard Goldblatt, whose superb translations of his major novels have not only conveyed the basic content of his stories, but even better than his native Chinese. As we know, Mo Yan's original Chinese is uh, somewhat awkward, uh, with a lot of uh, grammatical mistakes even in Chinese. But how the Goldblatt, uh, Goldblatt has bettered and beautified uh, his, uh, his uh, you know, um, uh, narrative uh, language in the English language. As for this, I will discuss later on. What I want to emphasize here is literary works uh, will still have some market, although it is shrinking uh, with uh, various challenges in the age of globalization and digitalization. What about the translation of scholarly works? Shall we still wait for such excellent translators like Goldblatt and Lee? It is almost impossible. I always think that writing scholarly articles and the monographs in English is another form of translation. It's not the form of word-for-word -word translation, but I think it's a, a culturally and academic translation, especially for us Chinese humanities scholars. For we could not merely translate our own works in a word-for-word -word manner into English. To write to domestic Chinese readers is different from writing to English and international readers. For the latter, usually have little knowledge about Chinese, uh, about China and Chinese culture. Since to promote Chinese culture worldwide is so urgent that we cannot wait for excellent translators like Goldblatt and Li to do the job, what we should do is to write directly in the English language and publish internationally. Although it is also difficult, there are quite a few successful examples in this respect. I myself am greatly benefited in writing in English and publishing internationally. That is, to write and publish in the major uh, world language, mostly on Chinese culture and Chinese issues, or at least from the Chinese perspective, to deal with some fundamental and universal academic issues. It is actually another type of translation, although not necessarily in a word-for-word -word manner. But unfortunately, its importance has not yet been realized by most of my Chinese colleagues. Some of them even complain why are Western scholars not able to study Chinese, since they are interested in learning things in China and Chinese culture. That is another matter. Others are still waiting in vain for a gold blood like translator to help spread their ideas internationally. But at present, to me, the hegemonic position of English cannot be shaken. Even if in the future, when Chinese has really become another major world language, it is still uh, more difficult for a non-Chinese native speaker to write in the language well. We still remember that the Indian-American post-colonial critic Gayatri Spivak once had a famous article entitled Can the Subaltern Speak? in which she tries to argue for those from the lower classes, especially from the so-called third world countries, who have long been unable to utter their voices at international forums. Even if they do intend to speak, they cannot be heard or acknowledged. What they could do 
is to find some agencies through which they could utter their voices in the wrong way. As we know, China has long been a third world country, although it is in recent years undergoing a sort of de-thirdworldizing experience for its rapid economic growth. So the current China, Chinese status is suspicious of by many uh, people who have uh, paid particular attention to the growth uh, of China economically. So if we start from her speech to reflect on the state of international uh, China studies at the time, it was particularly true in the humanities. In this sense, we might well change the title of her speech into Can the Chinese speak on the international forum? Of course, yes, they could, I think, even in the past. But they did not have the chance to speak, or no one wanted to listen to them speaking, even if they have the chance. So even if they did have the chance, they could not thus be heard. In mapping world uh, literature, Chinese literature was often deliberately ignored. In a volume about literary history, for instance, in one of the such books written by a French scholar, Chinese literature is only allotted 130 pages, and the literatures of India, 140 pages, but the literatures in French are given 12 times more space. In another book on world uh, uh, literature by a German scholar, Chinese literature, along with all the non-European literatures, is totally ignored. Even in such authoritative Northern anthology of world uh, masterpieces, for the first edition, there is no Chinese also included. Only uh, in the second and the third edition, yes, and one and more Chinese authors have been included. Thanks for yeah, my, old, my friend Martin Puchner, uh, who has become the general editor. We are in recent years uh, fortunate enough to have such far-sighted Euro-American scholars like David Demrush, who served as general editor of the London Anthology of Chinese uh, of World uh, Literature, which included more than 30 Chinese authors. And Teo Dan, who has also the uh, Rutledge Companion to World uh, Literature, and also uh, Rutledge History of World uh, Literature and Martin Putner, who are more and more interested in knowing Chinese literature and have tried to include in the edited anthologies or history of world literature as many excellent Chinese literary works as possible. I am sure that uh, their effort has undoubtedly contributed a great deal to the reconstruction of global culture and remapping uh, world uh, literature. And no doubt, those uh, Eurocentrists must be responsible uh, for this deliberate ignore of Chinese literature. But on the other hand, Chinese translators should also be responsible. For while we spend much time and energy translating foreign literature and academic works into Chinese, we pay little attention to vice versa. There has thus appeared uh, such an imbalance in literary and uh, cultural translation in China. It is true that after the founding of the People's Republic of China, the country was isolated for quite a period of time, till 1978, when it started to open itself to the outside world and practice economic reform. During the past decades, almost all the cutting-edge Western academic works and literary writings had been translated into Chinese, mostly by green hands. We can thus easily find the imbalance in the process of Sino-Western culture and academic exchange. An opening China, an opening new China was very eager to know what had happened in the outside world, especially in the West, while the outside world hardly wanted to know what was going on in China especially they hardly wanted to listen to what Chinese people were speaking. 
Obviously, there are many reasons behind this which might well account for the striking contrast. Of course, China was at the time poor economically. A poor country is supposed not to offer any good experience to the world. Another important reason is that Chinese scholars could not speak or write in good English, nor could they publish internationally. During the aphasia of the domestic Chinese scholars on the international forums, international scholarship largely depended on the Sinologists, who were supposed to speak for China and publish in international journals on China studies. Frankly speaking, most of the Sinologists are very friendly to China and Chinese scholars. They love China and publish their research results on the basis of their careful investigation and consideration. Some of them, such as David Hawkes, Stephen Owen, Mabel Lee, Wilt Edelman, Wolfgang Kubin, Johann Manquist, Howard Goldblatt, and Anna Chen, spend much time or even their lifetime translating excellent Chinese literary works into their own languages. But they are only very few outstanding representatives of Western Sinologists. But due to the false description about China as a result of Orientalism, some other Sinologists appear very naughty, holding that it is they rather than domestic Chinese scholars who can speak or write about China. But ironically speaking, uh, what they speak or write about China is mostly based on the um, incomplete or even misunderstanding of China and Chinese people. But during those isolated years, they could more or less convince the outside world. But in essence, they can by no means represent entire China, international China studies scholarship. Over 30 years have passed with tremendous changes taking place in China's humanities and social sciences. We are very delighted to see that in any research universities in the world today, we can easily find academic journals on China studies. What makes me even more delighted to see is that in almost all these academic journals on China studies, we have no difficulty finding quite a few Chinese names as authors. Some of them are affiliated with mainland Chinese universities or research institutes. Almost all the editors of these journals, so far as I know, are very eager to know what domestic Chinese scholars are speaking. This is really a big progress made in the age of globalization, in which China is most benefited from the advent of globalization, not only economically, but also politically and culturally. Along with the rapid development of Chinese economy, China's international image has, as a political and economic power is no longer suspected. Globalization has indeed offered us a common ground on which scholars from different countries can have equal dialogues on some fundamental uh, universal issues, changing, exchanging views and discussing issues of common interest. In this aspect, scientists have made a pioneering step in publishing internationally. And in also in recent years, uh, more and more uh, scholars of humanities and social sciences in China have realized the importance of publishing internationally. As a newly emergent power in science and technology, China's status is more and more recognized by international communities. But what about China's humanities and social sciences on the international scale? We are not so optimistic, although more and more domestic Chinese scholars have realized the importance of writing in English and publishing internationally. In many fields of the humanities and social sciences, very few scholars, Chinese scholars, have published in the leading international academic journals. Take the humanities, for example. In the mainstream journals of philosophy and the social sciences, Chinese scholars can hardly utter their voices, nor are they able to discuss the fundamental theoretical issues with their international colleagues in an equal way. 
I think that apart from the lacking in professional English writing, they also lack the basic academic training in thinking and writing. That is, they do not have the common academic discourse in discussing with their international challenge, uh, colleagues. But even so, the editors of some of the international journals, including China Studies journals, are very sympathetic. They know that in discussing fundamental theoretical issues, they should listen to all the scholars, be they from the West or from the East. Some of them even ask leading Chinese scholars to edit special issues by inviting distinguished scholars of the relevant fields to contribute to the journals. In this way, uh, they could hear directly from Chinese scholars on the cutting-edge theoretical issues of common interest and concern. Since the mid-1990s, I have edited and published about 10 special issues in some international English journals, from which we can find uh, what international literary and cultural scholarship are most interested in and what they want to know from Chinese scholarship. Although very few of the, uh, uh, yeah, the above special issues have been or will be published in the journals of China studies, we can still find that almost all the special issues are closely concerned about China studies, or at least about Chinese Western comparative literature, comparative literature and culture studies. That is, in publishing internationally, we Chinese scholars should focus on topics concerning China studies, especially contemporary China studies, which can hardly be adequately done by those outside of China. In writing and publishing on Chinese issues in English, we are actually playing the role of translator, not just translating word for word our Chinese articles, but rewriting our ideas in another language and academic discourse. For I always think that to promote Chinese culture worldwide, we can depend more or less on the translation done by the Sinologists. But we should lay more emphasis on our own efforts, especially in humanities studies. Sinologists are after all very few in number and excellent sinologists usually pay more attention to their own research and publications. I am sure that along with more and more domestic Chinese scholars writing and publishing in English, the international journals on China studies will play a more and more important role in translating and publishing Chinese scholars' excellent works so that the Chinese scholars will really be able to speak on the international forums the last section is about the future of Chinese through translation. On, the, on November 11, 2012, the Swedish Academy announced that Chinese novelist Mo Yan was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature for his work as a writer who with hallucinatory realism merges folk tales, history and the contemporary. According to Swedish Academy head Peter Anglund, I quote, he has such a damn unique way of writing. If you read half a page of Moyen, you immediately recognize it as him, end of quote. Largely due to the English translation of his major works done by Howard Goldblatt and the Swedish translation done by Anna uh, Gustafsson Chen, he has been referred by Donald Morrison of US News Magazine Time as one of the most famous off banded and widely pirated of all Chinese writers, according to, according to you know, uh, Morrison. Unfort undoubtedly, the fact that Mo Yan has won the Nobel Prize for Literature has been enthusiastically hailed by the majority of Chinese writers and ordinary readers as a sat satisfactory beginning that Chinese literature has really been recognized by the authoritative international institutions. As a matter of fact, Mo Yan's winning of the Nobel Prize is by no means coincidental. It is also a success of translation. 
So far as I know, Goldblatt started to translate Moyen's works at the beginning of the 1990s and published his first novelette, Red Sorgen, in 1993, when Moyen had just been well known domestically, but far behind many of his contemporary Chinese counterparts. At first, Moyen could not even publish his short stories in Renmin Wenxue or Shanghai Wenxue and So Hu and, uh, and you know, uh, Hua Chen, uh, some of the leading literary magazines in China. So Moyen was not even find, uh, fully recognized by the domestic literary and the critical authority. But some far-sighted literary critics and scholars in the West have long found his potential creativity as a, uh, as a promising writer. Apart from Goldblatt, Dawei Fukuma, another eminent sinologist and comparatist, who reread uh, the avant-garde uh, texts from a Western and a comparative perspective over 10 years later, in his recent article entitled Chinese Postmodernist Fiction, discusses three of its representatives, among whom Mo Yan comes first. Indeed, from its very beginning of his literary career, Mo Yan has had a broad vision of world literature. He aimed at uh, such important uh, Western masterpiece. Uh, um, uh, literary masters as uh, William Faulkner and uh, Garcia Marquez. He not only writes for his own country uh, fellows of Gaomi County, or Chinese readers, but also for readers of the entire world, as he touches upon some, some of the very fundamental problems which human beings are confronted with. Among all the Western writers he has read, he admires most uh, the modernist uh, William Faulkner and the postmodernist Garcia Marquez, and has been greatly inspired by their writings. It is true that, like Faulkner, who sticks to a stamp like small town of Lafayette County in his writings, Mo Yan confines many of his works to his native place, Gaomi County, Shandong Province. Similarly, like Garcia Marquez, he creates a fantastic and even hallucinatory atmosphere in many of his works, in which mysterious and realistic elements are intermingled and violence and, uh, and death appear somewhat unbelievably bizarre and fantastic. But without the excellent English translation done by Goldblatt, Mo Yan would still remain silent in the English-speaking world let alone attracted the attention by Swedish Academy. People might say, yes, if uh, Goldblatt had not translated Mo Yan's works, some other sinologists would also have translated his works, but it would be delayed. It is chiefly the English translation that has endowed Mo Yan with a continued life and afterlife. In this way, we should be very grateful to Goldblatt and other translators of Mo Yan's works in other major international languages, for their great efforts have indeed effectively pro promoted Mo Yan as well as contemporary Chinese literature and culture in the world. Like many of the Chinese avant-garde novelists, Mo Yan is not interested in the content of the stories he tells, but rather he seems more interested in how to tell his stories well, by using the various artistic devices, well, by putting the fragmentary historical events in his narrative domain, and make an unbelievable story believable, so that it reads like a real history. Largely due to his superb narrative innovation, Mo Yan has become one of the very few contemporary Chinese writers who has a wide international reputation, with almost all his important works translated into English and other major international languages. And quite a few critical articles or essays have been published in English dealing with his major works. Standing at this point, I cannot but reflect on this uh, conspicuous phenomenon. If Mo Yan's works were not translated by Goldblatt 
and Anna Chen, two of the most devoted translators in English and Swedish, and true lovers of literature. Could he also have won the Nobel Prize in 2012? The answer is obviously negative, although we could say that some other translators could do the job instead. But his prize winning would most probably have been delayed, or he would have missed this great honor in his lifetime, like many of uh, the writers elsewhere. We cannot require all the literary translators to have a good command of Chinese and devote most of their time and energy to translating Chinese literary works into the major world languages. In this sense, we still uh, we will have a shift in the current circles of Chinese translation, from translating foreign works into Chinese to that translating Chinese works into the major uh, world languages, especially English. Although we still think it necessary to translate excellent foreign literary and academic works into Chinese. Obviously, in quickening the speed of internationalizing Chinese literature and humanities, we will put more emphasis on the latter. On the other hand, we should not neglect the importance of popularizing Chinese worldwide, although it does take more time for a non-Chinese native speaker to grasp the language than grasp English. If we make joint efforts with our international colleagues, we will certainly succeed in promoting Chinese to the position of the major language only next to English. But we cannot work without the intermediary of translation, for it is translation that helps to relocate global cultures in the current era and perhaps in the near future. And it is uh, those excellent translators like Goldblatt, Li, and Anna Chen, whose superb translations have endowed Chinese literary works to have a continued life and afterlife in the other languages and the cultural environments. So in this way, we should be very grateful to all those who have translated Chinese literary works and the theoretical works into the major international languages without whose great efforts, Chinese culture and literature would not be known internationally. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Wong. We do have some time for questions. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, take the private of the time. <coughs> your emphasis on the role of translation in relocating global cultures, especially with respect to Mouyen. I'm just wondering if you would comment uh, on the role of film in this process, because it seems to me that as important as these translations, these literary translations are for the visibility of somebody like Mouyen, surely the cinematic adaptations of films like Red Sorghum yeah, yeah. Um, are, are tremendously important as well. Of course, they do introduce this dynamic of distortion as the price for popularization that you were talking about earlier oh. in, in the case of Asian American um, novelists. But I wonder if you could comment a little bit in general terms or specifically with respect to Moyet on the role of, of cinema in this work of global translation. Yes, I think, you know, <coughs> Uh, to uh, in this aspect, uh, uh, Zhang Yimou also played a very important role to promote uh, Mo Yuan internationally in the film world. Because you know, as far uh, as we know, in in the 1990s, when Mo Yuan was uh, not very well known, even domestically, uh, his Red Sorghum uh, was published. Uh, and then his, uh, 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 his short uh, novel was immediately translated by Goldblatt. And even so, still, uh, you know, according to Goldblatt, who told me very frankly, yeah, to translate uh, uh, Mo Yuan is largely due to my own interest and love for literature. Because, you know, um, according to Goldblatt, uh, who has made uh, very little money in translating serious Chinese literary works, he said he also translated some popular Chinese literary works, uh, who enabled him, yes, to, uh, to have some profits. He said, um, 
uh, you know, I asked him the question. Um, when Mu Yan won the Nobel Prize for Literature, did you get some more profits? He said, well, no, because at the time, I just uh, found a publisher who uh, was w uh, willing to publish Mu Yan's work. But at the time, I just got, uh, got uh, you know, one sum of the money as payment, uh, rather than uh, just the royalties. But Mo Yen got the royalties. But now uh, Mo Yen could get more royalties, but uh, I could not get, 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 get anything. But fortunately, um, uh, Mo Yen invited him. Invited him, yes, to be present at the Swedish Academy and paying him uh, business class and also book him a five-star hotel, yes, in, in, um, uh, in Stockholm. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, Yes, I think you know uh, uh, Mo Yan was largely benefited from uh, from the screening of his uh, short novel Red Sorgen uh, because ar around um, the premiere of Red Sorgen um, there was a, a huge debate uh, both at home and abroad <coughs> about uh, for whom uh, you know um, the Red Sorgen yes uh, was uh, written. Some people say Red Sorgen was not. Uh, written for domestic Chinese scholars, uh, Chinese uh, readers, uh, but uh, only for international, in, international uh, reading public. And Zhang Yimou's film is a kind of, uh, you know, characterized by Orientalism, uh, yeah, especially, you know, after, after the premiere of another film, uh, not by, uh, adapted from Mo Yan's work, uh, but from, adapted uh, from, from Su Tong's work, uh, Su Tong's work, Qi uh, Qi's, Chen uh, Qing raised the red uh, lantern. Uh, one of the one of the uh, the, um, the literary critics Wang Gan even angrily uh, published a short article in Wen Hui Bao for whom the red uh, who, for whom the red lantern is raised is not raised by uh, is not uh, raised for Chinese you know people but raised for uh, mm, you know uh, th those who stick to orientalism and uh, some people also uh, criticize um, you know uh, Mo Yan as well as uh, Zhang Yimou uh, for not producing their works you know uh, for readers or audience but for uh, you know the committee uh, to for you know uh, uh, the price committee and uh, especially uh, uh, you know they just uh, criticize Zhang Yimou but uh, um, but anyway you know uh, Mo Yan uh, was well known yes uh, through uh, the successful premiere of of Red Sorgen then uh, he immediately produced uh, many uh, many others. You know, uh, nowadays I was told that almost all Mo Yan's works, uh, novels, have been bought by film studios. Uh, even, uh, even I think even uh, the least, the uh, least possible popular, you know, a novel, yeah, was all, um, uh, also bought by by you know by the film uh, director at a very high price and Mo Yan became the richest uh, you know um, a writer uh, in the year 2000, 2012 yeah, yeah. Um, that also brings to mind like Steve Owen's uh, idea that Beidou's poetry was popular because it was written to be translated and so forth it's a very common kind of thing to say the stuff that's popular over here yeah. must have been written for over here. What do you think about the argument that Mo Yan wrote for Hong Gaoyang for a Western audience? Um, evidence was brought up. Uh, in speaking of Beidou, you know, uh, Stephen uh, Owen, I still remember, you know, uh, Stephen uh, Owen uh, many years ago uh, published an article commenting on the English translation done by, by uh, Bonnie Maduro about the, the translation of uh, Beidou's poem. According to Stephen Owen, the translation reads not like a Chinese poem, but rather like an English poem uh, written by an original, you know, uh, English poet. The same is true of Red Sorgen, uh, which also reads like uh, a story written by Goldblatt himself. Goldblatt, <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, uh, Goldblatt also practices writing novels in Chinese, but not in 
English. He said he translates, he translates Chinese uh, from Chinese into English. He also, in order to improve his Chinese, he also practices uh, writing in Chinese. But he has never published any novels in Chinese. But I'm sure uh, if he wants to publish his novels in Chinese, it would certainly yes, the, be very easy to find a Chinese pub, pub, published things. Uh, you know, Goldbart is uh, the most famous American translator. His Chinese name, Ge Haowen, is almost known uh, by every household in China. Who uh, knows Mo Yan? You know. Uh, of course, as far as, as, as uh, you know, uh, Mo Yan's works about um, Orientalism. Yeah, some people also have this. So that's why uh, after Mo Yan's prize winning, uh, some of the leading Chinese writers keep silent. I think uh, perhaps uh, if I just uh, name of them, uh, you may immediately recognize their positions. Uh, which are as equal as uh, Mo Yan. According to, uh, you know, statistics, uh, Liu Zhenyun, Wang Anyi, Yan Lianke, Jia Pingwa, and uh, yes, uh, they just uh, keep silent. They do not make any comments about uh, Mo Yan's uh, prize uh, winning. Only Su Tong, Su Tong made some comments and um, greatly appreciated Mo Yan's prize winning because Su Tong was also among the list of uh, possible candidates. Uh, and Su Tong is uh, much younger than Mo Yan, so Su Tong is still promising. But other people who are either older than Mo Yan or just uh, uh, at the same age, they said, well, we are totally disappointed. In the past, um, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are at the same level with uh, Mo Yan, or even uh, better known than Mo Yan, uh, such as Jia Pingwa and Liu Zhenyun. But nowadays, uh, all critics' attention are paid yes, to Mo Yan, and they are, you know, uh, they, they are just marginalized. Their books can only be printed in, I think, at the most uh, 10,000 copies. But Mo Yan's works could be uh, printed in at least uh, 200,000 copies. Only one e by one event, prize uh, winning. So that's uh, 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 the problem. And other people also criticize uh, Mo Yan. Actually, you know, uh, there are two entirely uh, different criticism. One says, yes, um, uh, Mo Yan is the, the spokesman of the, the Chinese uh, government, but I don't think, think so. Other people, people say, uh, Mo Yan um, is, uh, um, you know, conscientiously aimed to uh, writing to the English audience. I don't think so either. I think uh, Mo Yan stands just between the two. On the one hand, you know, he is aimed at uh, the Nobel Prize from its uh, very beginning. Yes, you know, I once had some, you know, uh, contact uh, uh, with Mo Yan uh, about, uh, let me see, about 10 years ago uh, at, uh, at a dinner. Uh, I said uh, to Mo Yan, you are very promising as a candidate for Nobel Prize uh, for literature, he said, uh, do you think so? I, I'm not sure. I said, well, you must be waiting, uh, 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 waiting for some critical studies and uh, scholarly studies uh, because you are still young. Uh, and then and at the time, I already know that Swedish Ac Academy organized the Swedish translation and also English translation and uh, scholarly studies about Mo Yan, also about some some others, such as uh, Jia Pingwa, Li Rui, and also Su Tong. But Mo Yan is among them. And Mo Yan uh, is, uh, uh, I think, uh, among the first of their candidates. So I think uh, it's uh, by no means uh, accidental yes, for him yes, to be uh, uh, awarded a Nobel Prize for literature. The other thing is, uh, according to Swedish Academy, especially the former, the former chairman of the Nobel Prize a committee, Kier Espermark, uh, whom I knew in the 1980s when he first came to, chi to China. He said to me, um, 
The day will come when Chinese writers won the Nobel Prize for literature. It just takes some time. He said it in 19, uh, 1991. When he came to China, I served as his interpreter. And he told me about that. And then in 1996, I asked him the question once again. He said, just be patient. It takes some time. Finally, you know, uh, Gao Xingjian was awarded in the year 2000. Yeah. Okay, uh, um, I'm happy that you mentioned my friend on the Gustav von Chen so many times, uh, the, the, and, and that you mentioned Swedish as if it were a, like a world language. <laughs> it's not. It's, it's become a world language because it is no longer But uh, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you: you mentioned uh, French, Japanese, English, German as hegemonic imperial languages, and then you mentioned Chinese and Spanish as kind of counter hegemonic languages. Isn't Chinese a uh, hegemonic language itself? And that has expanded at the expense of other languages. And how, you know, we're talking very much about soft power. How are we going to, how, how is Chinese literature and Chinese culture going to be dealing with those competing voices within the Chinese speaking Oikumen, people who write in Chinese who are not native speakers, or people who are, <coughs> uh, sp have to speak Mandarin, although they're grown up in Cantonese? There are those tensions within the Chinese language sphere. And how, you know, because I think one of the crucial reasons why English is, why a lot of people, including myself, are quite comfortable with it is that it has many sociolects and dialects and Englishes. There is like a, you know, a Swedish English, mm -hmm. <laughs> there is a German English. Um, <coughs> will there be a, such a polyphony in, 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 in the Chinese language? And um, how do you think, how do you see that coming about? I think, you know, <coughs> uh, Chinese, uh, um, Within the area of Great China, you know, Chinese is also hegemonic. I, I'm sure, uh, especially you know, Mandarin Chinese, the Putonghua, the so-called Putonghua. And nowadays, uh, we may find almost all the minority, you know, people could speak Mandarin Chinese. Although they have, uh, they also speak their own uh, own languages, uh, which are regarded as a kind of dialects. Only six minority languages uh, have transcripts, uh, such as uh, Tibetan, uh, Uyghur, uh, Mongolian, Korean, and you know, uh, you know, uh, have their own own you know languages uh, written languages. Even 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 uh, Manchuri uh, people cannot write. Uh, their own languages. They could only speak, and uh, and also, ironically speaking, um, in in China, a lot of you know Korean, uh, you know people from Korean uh, ethnic uh, minority from uh, Mongolian uh, minority try to uh, to forget their uh, national identity. Uh, they are cynicized or they just uh, forget their own languages. They try to forget their own la languages uh, by identifying themselves as, uh, as you know, as uh, uh, Han, uh, Han uh, you know, uh, a national and a cultural identity. So in this way, y yes, I should say, uh, Chinese is also hegemonic. But internationally speaking, uh, Chinese is uh, being hegemonic. Uh, from now on, because you know the Chinese government has invested a huge amount of money, uh, set, setting up a different you know Confucius institutes. I was told that uh, Confucius Institute here was set up directly by Han Ban, you know uh, the Chinese government you know uh, agency to promote Chinese language and culture, and also uh, to promote Chinese arts uh, here. Actually, according to my to my knowledge and the Confucian Institute usually have two have two tasks one is to teach uh, Chinese language yes yeah, to uh, all those who are interested in Chinese uh, culture the other one is uh, to to lecture on Chinese culture in the in in the English language or some other languages so in this way I'm sure uh, you know uh, Chinese uh, is uh, also being hegemonic. It's trying to compete with uh, with uh, English, and also uh, domestically, uh, some of uh, you know the conservative scholars of uh, nationalistic uh, sentiment uh, try to argue uh, why don't we 
you know, uh, require foreigners to speak Chinese when they come to China. We should also give them examinations, like uh, uh, what we take uh, uh, for TOEFL examination. Because in, in the past, uh, when we Chinese uh, students want to study uh, in the English-speaking world, they always, uh, uh, you know, have to pass the TOEFL and at uh, a very high marks before they could be uh, um, admitted. Uh, but nowadays, uh, also, uh, a lot of uh, foreign students uh, have to pass uh, uh, HSK, but at a very low level, you know. Uh, so still, I think it's um, a progress, but still uh, far from uh, what the requirements, you know, <laughs> you know are made by by a foreigners, yes, to Chinese students. But I think um, maybe in the years to come, um, it will be more and more strict yeah, for foreigners to have a good command of Chinese. Yeah. You seem to be relying on uh, Westerners to translate Chinese into literature for uh, very successful translations. I was wondering what can be done about that? Of course, there are examples of people whose native language was not English, who wrote tremendously well, Conrad and Nabokov, for instance. So one would think that there could be a way to uh, train people whose native language is not English to do a good job of translation. Uh, in recent years, we got access to uh, master's thesis and then doctoral thesis in yeah. China. Yeah. Maybe you began about 10 years ago. <coughs> Lots and lots of thesis being uh, published on translation. But generally, they tend to favor any uh, native Chinese translator over any English translator. And that's not very convincing. So for instance, Wang Lungpei's uh, translation of Pini Pili is not very good. Uh, and so what is going on in translation studies? Do you see any hope that we, uh, China will be able to uh, the, uh, train translators who can translate as well as anybody? Uh, nowadays, actually, yes, uh, we are already changing, uh, changing the dominance of translating from uh, from you know foreign languages into Chinese to change to translating Chinese into the major world languages. In this way, yes, I also argue uh, like you that um, uh, many of the greatest you know stylists uh, are not native English speakers, uh, such as you know uh, Joseph Conrad, Nabokov. And also the first English grammatical uh, uh, English um, you know grammarian, and is the author yes person who is Danish, and uh, and uh, also the the first uh, lexicographer of of Chinese calligraphy is not a Chinese a native Chinese but a Rush, uh, but rather a Japanese scholar. So in this way, it's possible, yes, for Chinese to master uh, the English language uh, and also translate uh, translate Chinese uh, from Chinese into into excellent uh, literary English. Uh, but you know, many of my Chinese colleagues uh, do not think so uh, because uh, uh, they think uh, yes, what we could do is to translate from foreign languages into Chinese, which is much easier for them to do. But to uh, translate uh, into the foreign languages is uh, uh, much more difficult. The other thing is we do not have the market. So that's why I promote, I encourage my colleagues just to write directly uh, their scholarly uh, monographs in English rather than depending on translation. Uh, my, old, uh, my friend, Professor Li Zhe-ho, is uh, the most famous Chinese theorist in the 20th century, uh, but who is marginalized in the United States, although he has become an American citizen. His Mei uh, Xie has been included into Norton Anthology of Theory and Criticism, and he was um, more than willing uh, to see in his lifetime, because now he is uh, already 83 years old. Uh, in China, he is known uh, he, uh, everywhere by almost all the students of humanities and social sciences. Uh, but in the United States, very few people know him, even in the name, you know. So that's why uh, I think, yes, to publish in English is, uh, is more impo Im uh, Im important, at, at least at the moment. Yeah. I was curious to know, um, I was curious what you thought 
parts of Chinese cultures that are not accessible to translation, period. Whether it be literal word for word translation or translation of the more creative kind that you're talking about, more discursive translation. Um, that word translation to touch it, with, to transform it or just distort it. Um, and in keeping with Spivak's notion, right, Spivak's can the subaltern speak? It's not just the provocative question, but her um, realization of the conundrum, which is that sure, the subaltern can speak, but as soon as the subaltern speaks, she's no longer subaltern, right? So is there something about any kind of translational, translingual conversion that um, that transforms the thing that it that, that is being translated, and are there recessive, you know, kinds of recessive information, cultural information that translation cannot touch? Or should not touch? Uh, yes, uh, that's true. But uh, even so, even so, I think so. That's why I uh, do not stick to word for word translation because some uh, something you know some very uh, very nationalistic you know, ideas in ancient Chinese uh, can hardly be being word for word translated uh, into any foreign languages. But even so, it's possible, yes, to rewrite, uh, to, uh, to re, uh, rephrase them, yes, in the culture and this interpretive way. In this way, translation also means interpretation. Translation uh, also, uh, you know, uh, makes the original again in translation, you know. Uh, sometimes uh, translation, yes, uh, could, uh, especially accent translation, uh, will enable the original, yes, to have uh, the continued and afterlife, according to B uh, Benjamin. Also, according to Gaiji Spivak, uh, Spivak uh, himself, uh, herself uh, gained uh, from her translation of the Derrida's De la Grammatology. According to Gaji Spivak, who lectured at Tsinghua University, at, at that time, she was only a graduate student. She saw uh, Derrida's book on the catalog of um, you know, uh, a publisher. So she was interested in that, and then she, she bought a copy of the telegrammatology. And then she spent six years translating from French into English. And she became well known. And then after that, uh, she gave up translation. She wrote directly, you know, uh, her own theoretical uh, works. And so in, in this way, we should say, um, you know, uh, according to David Demrush, uh, world uh, literature is those uh, which could gain in tra translation. Sometimes translation would transform. Translation uh, will, will make the original better known, which uh, um, will, uh, you know, uh, due to bad translation will be degraded. Uh, we can find a lot of uh, such examples, such as the Barzak's works, uh, which were translated by Fu Lei, were very popular, yes, in China. But unfortunately, several years ago, uh, the People's Literature Press once uh, wanted to organize a new translation because they thought Fuley's translation is somewhat like rewriting. Very fluent, excellent, and uh, very elegant in Chinese, but Barzak's style is somewhat redundant. Unfortunately, when the new translation done by 20 Chinese translators were published, uh, they were only printed in 6,000 copies, and many of them uh, could not even be sold because people are used to reading Fu Lei's translation. Although they should say Fu Lei has his own style. So uh, in my opinion, excellent translations will make the original work even better. Bad translation will make the original, originally good work, you know, be degraded, you know. So in this way, yes, some of the, such as, you know, Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities, which was first of all translated by Dong Chiu the Chinese version was very awkward. It was only printed in several thousand copies, although Charles Dickens is extremely popular in, in Britain, you know. So sometimes the translation can change the status of the, 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 the original, yeah. Well, <coughs> thanks again for a wonderful presentation. Yeah, I want to thank you very much. Everyone.